Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry's here, too. And this is Stuff You Should Know, another animal edition, which everybody loves those, and so do I. I, think I would love to see a master list of all the animals that we've covered. Sure. It's probably longer than I think. Twice as long, maybe. <laughs> but these are about mingos. I'm super excited because, uh, <clears throat> A, I mean, who isn't sort of fascinated by flamingos? They're attention getters with their funny one-legged stance and their pink. Right. Uh, but when we finally went down to the Caribbean for the first time this year to mm-hmm. the Bahamas, mm-hmm. they had some mingos on their property. And they would do a, you know, you could walk by them and just say hi and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, they would do a little flamingo parade. Oh, really? Where they would walk them around the property. Uh (laughs) People would ooh and ah, or you could follow along, which, of course, we did. Uh Uh, And that just got my brain thinking, you know, uh, Ruby has had a painting. We got a a $10 painting, like a real painting that someone did with their hands for 10 bucks. That's quite a deal. Of a, a... tight grouping of flamingos kind of from the neck up Okay, that's been in her room her whole life almost. And I was just like, I got to learn about these things. That's a great composition, the group of flamingos from the neck up. I've seen yeah. it before. Not necessarily your painting, but I've seen that, that composition before, and it is. It's a trope. It's great. <laughs> no, it's good because it could be like trees or seagrass, like any spindly grouping of things. Um, so, so this is a a painting of seagrass. Well, you know what I mean. Tall, reedy, spindly. I see. Things. I see. Okay. Um, so this is a lot like the possum episode for me in that, like, I generally knew some stuff, but I learned a bunch of new cool stuff, and now I'm a big flamingo fan. Yeah, same. So you said something about them parading around. Apparently, so was there a human saying like, hey, this way, everybody, the parade's going this way, and the flamingos would kind of follow? Yeah, they had like a electric cattle prod. Right, right. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> no, flamingos no, no, respond no. to that really well. No, they had uh, humans that were just sort of walking along and sort of, it seemed like a, just a very gentle, wavy, corralling type of gesture. Right. So there's a um, a video artist, an Israeli video artist, who um, went to a zoo in Germany um, so cool. And she came up with a uh, a video, five-minute video called 69 Bows, I think, 67 Bows. 67. A, Get your head out of the gutter. A 67 <laughs> Bows. All right. Um, and it was the flamingos responding to a hand gesture she did, and all, all the flamingos would bow at once, but really it's like they're ducking. And then mm-hmm. the artist inserted... Um, I think very earnestly, but in retrospect, also really hilariously, a gunshot sound, and then the the <laughs> flamingos would duck every time the gunshot sound went off. It's pretty yeah, funny. that was a little weird. I didn't expect that. Um, this is, by the way, a video artist named uh, Naira or Nira uh, Pereg. Right. Give credit where credit's due, but sure. I saw the same thing, and it was it was interesting to see them move in unison. I, I watch a lot of flamingo videos. It's very fascinating the way they move yeah, about the earth. For sure. They do have a certain odd gangly grace to them, don't they? Yeah. So um, flamingos actually are different from just about every other bird. Apparently, their order, um, Phoenicopteriforms. Um, nice. Thank you. Uh, I have. I think you inserted out. an extra letter in there. No, but... I didn't. Phoenicopteriforms. So what's? <laughs> Should I quibble? No. I mean, yeah, there, sure, go ahead. I don't have an I after the C. I just have Phoenisopter oh, terraforms. Man. My <laughs> brain literally was like, nope, we're doing it. I don't care what you see. Um, we're do, oh, we're boy. adding the extra. So Phoenisopteriforms. Fen- yeah. Stupid brain. Your sounds better, if that makes you feel better. It does make me feel a little better. But that's yeah. that's the order that flamingos um, belong to. And there's only five species, as we'll see. <clears throat> but... Um, they are just the, like, it's just flamingos that belong to the order. And they diverged from other um, birds a really long time ago. Uh, but, you know, geneticists and um, biologists love to, to taxonomize things. So they've tried to figure yeah. out 
the closest living relative to the flamingo. And what we did for a very long time was like, oh, that animal looks like that animal. They must be very closely related. And as right. genetics have kind of come of age starting in around uh, 2000 was, I think, a really big turning point with the Human Genome Project. Um, th- we found that genetically speaking, that's a terrible way to classify things. And the flamingos are a good example of that. Yeah, it's kind of lazy. It is. It's also it's like a, it's old timey and dumb yeah. in that sense. You know what I mean? It is like, oh, they look like storks. So let's just put them in that group. And that's what they did for a while, storks and herons. And then, uh, no, maybe they're more like geese and swans and ducks, but that wasn't right. And finally, in the it took a while. I mean, the early aughts in 2001 is when they finally said, you know, genetically speaking, they're closest to something called, is that a grebe? I'm going to go with grebe. G-R-E-B-E-S. Mm-hmm. And they are sort of duckish. Mm-hmm. Uh, Livia helped us out. She said duck-like. I would agree with that. Uh, and it, what, what it did though, was it kind of brought up what we're talking about. Apparently, I don't think it was like a firestorm, but I think it was a case where they said, Hey, like we should do this better. And this is a prime example. Right. And the, um, old school taxonomists hung their head in shame and kind of slunk off and retired and died (laughs) at various times. That's right. So, uh, the word flamingo bears a striking resemblance to a Spanish word flamenco, which you can't say that word without putting without snapping one finger at about your stomach uh-huh. and one above your head. <laughs> I can, at least. I know. It's really the, the thing to do. And that, that word flamenco um, has, yeah. <laughs> uh, it means actually the bird, the flamingo. It also <clears throat> refers to that dance style and style of music, flamenco. Yeah. And it also refers to a person from Flanders, which is part of Belgium, right? So a Flemish person would be called a flamenco in oh, Spanish. Really? Yeah, and, and I'm not sure why those are connected and used in the same word, but they they are. All right. Well, that is weird. Uh, We are going to, I guess, talk about the the different kinds, uh, the species. You said five. Is there not a sixth? There's Okay, so I'm siding with the ones who say one's a subspecies of another. Oh, okay. All right. You've already uh, put yourself in a particular flamingo camp, I see. I I have, as a matter of fact, and I'm going (laughs) to stay there until genetics proves me wrong. All right, well, we'll start with the greater flamingo. Uh, this is the big fella. Um, they can be five feet tall. They can weigh up like close to nine pounds, mm-hmm. which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you look at a flamingo, there's a lot of um, bony ne- leg and there's not a lot of body there. A lot of negative space they don't take up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, these are pretty pale when it comes to their pink pinkness. Mm-hmm. And we should talk, and I guess through this, we'll talk about their distribution, because it may surprise you. Um, I kind of thought it was just like, yeah, they're in the Caribbean and Florida, and that's it. Right. But that's not true at all. No. Um, these are in Africa, uh, Southern Europe, and Asia, as in South Asia and Western Asia. Mm-hmm. And they like, one of the cool things about flamingos is they sometimes will live where no other animals can or will live. Uh, and that is really saline or alkaline lakes mm-hmm. and mud flats and places like that. Yeah, in that sense, they fill in a specific ecological niche that there's really not many other animals that that do. And that's just the first interesting, weird, unusual fact about um, oh, yeah. f- uh, flamingos, right? Just get ready. Yeah, I had no idea. So they eat like stuff in like the saltiest, briniest parts of Earth. That's where they that's where they like to be. So the Caribbean flamingo, uh, which we know of as the American flamingo, um, is considered by some, including myself, a subspecies of the greater flamingo, which would make there just five species of flamingo technically. Right. And these are the ones that I saw. Uh, They are smaller. They are super, super pink, Mm -hmm. very brightly colored. Yeah. Um, These are the same, very same flamingos, the ones that I saw that actor Leah Schreiber played with the week before. <laughs> oh, did he really, man? You know how when you get in a in a car to go to the place wherever you're going, yep. they like to, always like to talk about stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And this car driver was like, you know, I can't do the accent, but he said uh, that Ray Donovan was here last week, <laughs> and I went, oh, I was like, I love Lee F. Schreiber. And Emily, of course, looked it up, and he, um, if you want to see like forty pictures of Lee F. Schreiber's family doing things in the Bahamas. Uh, you can do that online because that's that must be what it's like to be a real celebrity. Right. I couldn't imagine. It was just picture after picture. Huh. Flamingos. And here he is at the water slide. And it's like, 
Did they just follow him around with a camera? And I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> I um I started to watch Ray Donovan once on a flight because um, I've heard nothing but good things about it. But I must yeah. have come in on like season five or something like that because, you know, on Delta, they <laughs> have little... like rando <laughs> yeah. episodes. It's so weird. Yeah, it's so strange. So I and when I came in, it was like the the either I think the season premiere of some late season and um, mm-hmm. like he he's clearly having some sort of mental breakdown because he's having mm-hmm. a crisis of conscience conscience from mm-hmm. killing it's people bad. and i was like oh yeah. this again <laughs> the killer ha- the killer can't just take killing any longer i'm like i'm not doing this i'm done yeah i i enjoyed we and we both loved that show emily and i for uh probably the first 3 or 4 seasons and then it was one of those that was like you should have known when to stop mm-hmm. and then we kind of just quit watching yeah i mean that happens a lot it does in America. That was the good thing about our show. We we knew. Well, actually, Science Channel knew to quit what while we were ahead. You know. <laughs> uh, what about the Chilean flamingo? What's up with that fella? These guys are particularly strange and unusual and fascinating because they like to live in the cold. Um, they can handle cold weather at least. Um, they live in Chile, in a lot of South America. In fact, I don't know why Chile got the. Um, the naming rights, but they typically have pink bands on their gray legs, which are something that kind of sets them off uh, from the other ones. And they're, I guess, yeah. the third in line as far as size goes. They're uh, right. smaller than Caribbean flamingos, bigger than the lesser flamingo, though, which is an, another a species, right? Yeah, such a sad name to call something the lesser flamingo. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are the smallest. They're about uh, three to three to five pounds ish. And they are also in Africa on the eastern uh, and southern, uh, well, I say coast, but they can go inland as well if they've got some good uh, good alkaline lakes going on. Right. But also in places like Yemen, yeah, you can find flamingos in Yemen, in Pakistan, mm-hmm. in India. Mm-hmm. Uh, these have the dark bills and the really, really red eyes that are just beautiful uh, to look at. And I believe this is the, the most abundant flamingo species, right? Yeah, there's like they'll gather in packs of like millions one and a half, two million, or at the very least, that's how many there are total. But they do they do gather in huge flocks, as we'll see. Yeah, uh, into the millions. That wasn't uh, hyperbole. By the way, Chuck, um, "Flamingos in Yemen" is an excellent album title. Oh man, <laughs> you're not kidding. I mean, talk about the album art too. It would be wonderful. Yeah, th- th- I could see like uh, I don't know who would do that. Franz Ferdinand or somebody. Franz Ferdinand or. Um, what was our, what did Ian Bowers say our um, Britpop band was? Something Star? Oh, I don't remember. That would be a great Something Star album, Flamingos in yeah. Yemen. We're claiming that for our band <laughs> that we create after we retire, okay? Uh, I just saw, by the way, Franz Ferdinand is opening for the Pixies on their next leg, which goes through Atlanta. Sweet. When? Uh, in June. Oh, that's pretty cool, man. Uh, yeah, I I used to love those guys. I've been on a huge Pixies kick right now, um, which I had been way off the Pixies for a while. Like, man, am I ever going like, to like the Pixies again? As far again? as new music? Uh, I haven't heard any of the new stuff. I've just been, I just got off of their old stuff, and then I got yeah. back into um, Trompe Le Monde, which, I mean, mm. it, it's just so good from start yeah. to finish. So, yeah, I love the Pixies again, everybody. And I don't really like Ray Donovan. So there's the two things to, you need to know about me from this episode. Their new one uh, that came out late last year is okay. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a Pixies record, but it's just, it's not as weird. Oh, yeah? It's kind of polished. It, I don't know. It just sounds like, hey, we're going to make a Pixies record, so let's do that. Okay. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think the new bass player is doing a great job, but I, I do miss Kim Deal. So, I mean, yeah, you got to respect that, though. That they're not just you like, know? we're going to cash in on the, th- you know, three, five albums that everybody's yeah. crazy about from the 80s and early 90s and yeah. just tour He's, on that. They still want to make, yeah. Yeah. Although that's mostly what they play. Thank goodness. So let's <laughs> let's um, let's talk about, I think, the coolest flamingo, or at least the most interesting of the flamingos. Obviously, the Caribbean flamingo is the money flamingo, far and away the best, just because it's so pink yeah. and pretty and perfect size and all that stuff. But the Andean flamingo, for my money, is the most interesting of all. Yeah, they're very rare. And it's just, uh, I had no idea that they could live high up in the Andes mountains like that. Um, I was just blown away by that because I, th- I thought they were really exclusively, um, you know, like I said, sort of coastal mm-hmm. birds. Yeah. But um, there aren't a lot of them, about 80,000 of them. 
And uh, you will be very saddened to know that those lithium batteries that we all love, Mm -hmm. because they last so long, lithium mining and climate change are uh, driving them away and destroying them. Batteries kill flamingos. That's right. So, yeah, there's about 80,000 of them alive, and they are, I think, under threatened status, which is one step down from endangered and very much threatening to move into endangered. So, I don't know. Yeah, the Andean is vulnerable. Vulnerable. Okay. So, that's... Which is one step down. Okay, I got you. Thanks. No problem. And then James's flamingo is the one that you don't consider... Like a, a full-fledged flamingo? No, no, that's its own. That's a species. It's the um, Caribbean flamingo that I consider a subspecies of the greater oh. flamingo. Okay, all right. Yeah, J- I got you. James's flamingo is, um, they thought it was actually extinct um, in the 1920s, I believe. But then in the 50s, it's a whole coelacanth comeback story because they discovered <laughs> that there actually were James's flamingos uh, that were mixed in with Chilean and Andean flamingos in South America um, and not mixed in like they were interbreeding, like the, these huge flocks. Like we'll get across the flocks of flamingos in the wild are so enormous and so populous. It's crazy. But um, these flocks will or these different species will kind of flock together, but they they keep their distance from one another. And that's where they rediscovered the James's flamingo that wasn't extinct after all. Yeah, named after the British naturalist who studied them, uh, Harry Berkeley James. And I guess he just felt good enough about his work where he said, I'm going to name you after me. Yeah. Now let's go have some mead. Right. <laughs> uh, all right. I think we should take a break and have some mead. Sure. And we'll talk about their pinkness right after this. Stuff you should know. All right, we're back. Uh, One of the things I did know about flamingos, but only in a rudimentary way, was that they're pink because of what they eat. I did not know this at all. Oh, really? I think that's a kind of a common, like, basic flamingo fact, which is, why are they pink? I see. Because the stuff they eat, otherwise they... (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Not another one. (laughs) Not another serif. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody knows that, you moron. (laughs) Uh, Well, then, could you do us the the honors, please? Yes. And explain this? No, 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 you go ahead. You were explaining it fine. I was just teasing. Well, it's because what they eat is rich in Mm beta-carotene, and what they largely eat is uh, algae. Um, They they stick their face down. If you see flamingos walking around in, um, I guess, like ankle to uh, whatever their knees would be, knee-deep water, Mm -hmm. you'll see them stick their face down there a lot and rummage around, and sometimes they'll just leave it out there, like fully dunked. And what they're doing is they're eating their filter feeders like a baleen whale. Yeah. And they're just moving muddy water around and letting water swish around in their mouth. And they have these little, uh, uh, what is it, like a little filter? Yeah, I've 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 seen it it described as like a comb-like filter along their lower bill. Okay. No, their upper bill, yes, because they're upside down. So their upper bill is now their lower bill when they're feeding, and that's where the filter is, right? So they're they're kind of um, like that oil pulling, you know, some people swish essential oil in their mouth to, like, fight cavities or whatever. Well, I didn't know that. That's essentially what they're doing. They use their tongues to kind of swish the water back and forth and then spit it out and get some more water. And apparently they can do this, like, four times in a second. They're that fast to just gather oh, wow. really, really small stuff. But the stuff that they're eating is so full of beta carotene, um, carotenoids, actually, that the flamingos' um, livers break, the, break them down into a pigment. Which is a fun word to say, and I'm about to say it. You ready? Mm-hmm. Canthaxanthin. Oh, wow. That's way better than I would have said. I love it. It's one of my new favorite words. C-A-N-T-H-A-X-A-N-T-H-I-N. Canthaxanthin. Yeah, good job. So it ends up in their feathers and their skin, which turns them pink. And this is why, Chuck, I think that lesser and Caribbean, or Caribbean is a subspecies of greater, sorry, um, because the a big distinction, I mean, yes, the greater's a little bigger, not ridiculously bigger, but a big distinction is their coloring. And I think that it's because the Caribbean 
has more carotenoid rich diet than the yeah. greater and that they're really genetically essentially the same species. They just have different diets available to them. I, th- I think you're probably right. Um, and, you know, because they like to put uh, flamingos in places like zoos for a long time, you're like, hey, you feed these things red peppers and carrots and orange things, and they turn and they keep that color. Mm-hmm. So we're just going to feed them that, and which is terrible and a, v- a very lazy kind of point of view. Um, but, I th- you know, now zoos are mostly on board, I think, with uh, was saying, oh, okay, maybe we should just feed them what they like to eat right. that also keeps them pink. Yeah. Uh, and also, you can turn orange, everybody knows, from eating, like, too many carrots or mangoes mm-hmm. or something like that. Sweet potatoes Sports will do it, too. Tans. Yeah. Um, and that's a condition that uh, is called carotenemia, which will yeah. turn up in our live show eventually. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Look for it. Ooh, that's a nice little tease. Yeah. Watch for it this fall on Stuff You Should Know. <laughs> oh, speaking of tour, we should just go ahead and mention, because um, people are kind of asking. Yeah. We are doing these first three shows in real time this week that will be done by the time it comes out in uh, Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco. But uh, we are aiming to do six more shows in tiny little groups of three, mm-hmm. uh, hopefully in the in the late spring and early fall. And um, we haven't nailed the cities down, but, you know, that's that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> Not nine shows this year. You really put all those questions to rest. Well, I mean, could, should we mention some of those cities? I don't want people to be disappointed. Um, yeah, I don't know. Because we kind of know. I mean, they're going to be disappointed eventually. Why? Might as well just disappoint <laughs> them now so they can be disappointed all year. Well, I think we're going to finally hit Nashville. Yeah, that's the plan. Uh, I think we're going to do Orlando again mm-hmm. and finish up in Atlanta mm-hmm. again, our hometown shows. That's right. What about in between? Uh, well, we're um, out of the four. I think we're going to pick three from probably Boston. Uh, New York, D.C., and Chicago. Yeah. Uh, all cities that are great for Stuff You Should Know, uh, rich with Stuff You Should Know listeners. Yeah, and if we're going to do this, like, you know, maybe nine shows a year, we, we're going to have to mix it up because it's so easy to just yeah. go to, like, the same banger cities every time. But we've been to so many cities that turned out to be banger, like, surprising. Like, Kansas City was a great show. Uh, St. Louis was a great show. Yeah. Cleveland was a great show. Um, Lawrence, Kansas? Yeah. Austin's always the jam. Um, yeah. I mean, we've been to a bunch of places that were like, this is this is actually a really great time. We want to come back. It's just, um, you know, we, if we're doing nine shows this year, we we, guys, I, we just started out with our, our usual. How about that? Yeah, we're dipping our toe back in the live show pond. But we we also like to add a, a brand new state, and that's why we're going to Nashville this year. So uh, take heed. Take heed? Yeah, take heed, Boise. <laughs> yeah, I was about to go to Boise. Sure. We go see our old All friend right. Dave Roos. Is he Boise? That's his stomping ground, yeah. All right. I think you Bob can't tell by his too. incredibly chipper <laughs> and positive um, personality. That's true. Very Boisean. And by the way, Chuck, um, we should give a shout out to Dave's podcast, uh, Bible Time Machine, right? Yeah. Dave is a, a bit of a biblical scholar and takes a very sort of analytical uh, view of the Bible in this podcast. It's not like a preachy thing. Right, right. So if you want to get to know Dave Ruse, one of our great writers that works for Stuff You Should Know, you can get to know him a lot more wherever you get podcasts. Bible Time Machine. Yeah, dare I say, a sort of Stuff You Should Know-like approach to biblical matters. I mean, how could it not be, you know? Yeah. He's he's so ingrained. I know. Uh, Can we go back to Flamingos, for goodness sakes? Yes, because this is where it gets really interesting to me uh, is a lot of this stuff in the next five minutes. Oh, okay. Namely, namely their age. Did you know they, had, they live this old? No, dude. 20 to 60 years. Mm-hmm. And the oldest flamingo on record was 83 years old. Yeah. His name was Greater. He was a Greater Flamingo, and they named him Greater at the Adelaide Zoo. He showed up at the zoo in the 30s, and he died in 2014. And he was just this amazing resident. And apparently the Adelaide Zoo had like a flamingo encounter where their flamingos were able to mix with humans. Mm -hmm. And that turned out very badly for Greater in 2008 because four scumbag teenagers beat him almost to death for no reason other than he was there. He uh, was an animal. And I looked so hard to find out what happened to those teenagers. And all I could find was that they were charged 
no follow-up whatsoever, which really makes me think that they were released to their parents' custody, and they've probably been torturing animals ever since. Yeah, this this one was really tough to read about. Uh, I don't need to say anything else about it. It's yeah. disgusting. Yeah, it is disgusting. And I know that Australians are like the opposite of that as people. I know. It's really surprising. Hopefully yeah. they got um, hit in the butt with a giant boot like in, on The Simpsons. <laughs> or maybe they gave him the old Outback treatment. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. A dingo <laughs> ate my scumbag teenager. <laughs> See if you can find your way home, boys. <laughs> Uh, that's not, uh, of course, I don't, I'm not supporting, like, you know, <laughs> killing teenagers sure. in a retribu- retribution. But also, we're not supporting teenagers beating no. up animals. And getting away with it, Especially an elderly animal, too. It wasn't even, like, a, I know. a young animal. It was a 83, uh, well, let's see. So, he was uh, in his 70s, mid-70s yeah, 70s. Um, uh, flamingo <sighs> that they beat up. Yeah. I didn't mean like, to spend this much time on it, but I am a little worked up about it still. No, no, no. I'm with you, man. It's it's awful. Um, flamingos may want to travel occasionally. They're considered non-migratory, uh, but they will get out of Dodge if they need to. Um, if they, you know, if the food isn't good or whatever, or the water's um, too high or too low, they'll they'll go to greener pastures. And they'll do so with um, a plum because they can travel, man. Uh, They like to travel at night. They Mm -hmm. like those red-eye flights. And they can go like 300 to 400 miles a night. Yeah, they they travel between about 30 to 40 miles per hour typically. So that's 48 to 64 kilometers per hour. That's pretty fast, yeah, especially over 10 straight hours. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. But, yeah, they typically like to stay where they are. It's just if the environment changes, they're like, all right, we're out of here. we got to go find us a new alkaline flat. Yeah. Uh, what about the way they stand? Because that's what really every time I've seen flamingos, and this is one of the main reasons I dug into this, was why in the world did they stand there on one leg? Uh, well, they thought for a long time it was to conserve body heat, which is another. It must have come from the 19th century taxonomists. Yeah, I don't get that. That bony little leg isn't going to conserve any heat. Exactly. Um, but I guess they were like, well, there's no feathers or anything on it. So I guess it's a huge thing to lose heat. But Oh, uh, okay. There was I more that, investigation that was like, uh, no, actually, they have a really good system for conserving heat in their, their bony little legs. Um, so that's not it. And they think probably it's just that it's more stable and possibly more comfortable for them to stand on mm. one leg. Because they're able to lock the um, the tendons and ligaments and muscles and joints and everything in the leg that they're standing on, and it's just like you're not you're not going to fall over. Um, and then there's one other thing about this, Chuck. Um, they have a knee. It's not what you think. It's not in the mm-hmm. middle of their leg. That's not their knee. <laughs> okay. Their knee, uh, which allows them to move forward and backward, is um, where their where our hips are. It's up in their body, about where our, our hips are. That's what their knee. Well, where are their hips? I don't know. I saw that they have hips, though, that they do have hips that are similar to other birds, but I don't know if that was a reference to their actual knee. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you can tell they're locked in. Like, when they're standing there, they're not not swaying around. Like, put me on one leg for a little while, Mm -hmm. and you're going to see a little movement. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, you are. They tell you not to, like, lock your knees um, for very long because you can faint for some reason. We'll have to do a short stuff on that sometime. Oh, for humans? Yes. We're, we are not flamingo-esque in that respect. No, not at all. Uh, you mentioned their communities, and this is just amazing. They, uh, their, their colonies or their flamboyance, which is, yes. uh, we did a whole episode on, on those names. Um, a flamboyance of flamingos, I've, I've seen other places say a regiment Boom. or a flurry or a stand. Yeah. But why would you not say a flamboyance I, of flamingos? I don't know. I just, I just, just don't lock know. that in like a ligament. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So um, I think there was a study that was done in 2020 that kind of uh, looked at these groups and started to like actually pay attention to individual members of them and found that mm-hmm. like that these the the groups have incredibly complex social relationships and interactions and there's cliques within these larger groups and um, some members will have enemies and. Um, this is actually something I liked about flamingos. They tend to be very peaceful. Like, it's mm-hmm. not one of those things where you're like, oh, that beautiful pink bird likes to eat, tear the heads off of lizards and beat up one another or something like that. They're right. actually super yeah. peaceful animals. They like to avoid their enemies. They they don't, they're just kind of like, hey, man, 
relax, don't do it, you know, when you want to get to They have to besties? It. Yeah, they have yeah. friends. <laughs> um, they And they also are serial monogamists, as we'll see. Yeah, they get together uh, for a mating season, and they typically change it up after that mating season mm -hmm. and get a new partner. But they stick together through that mating season, and they will— um, they will they will co uh i guess well i guess we should talk about their breeding they they breed when they want to breed uh, which is kind of cool it's not like a certain time of year right. or you know any particular season it's just got to be like the the right spot the right um circumstance mm -hmm. and then they get it on and if you want to see some fun stuff just go on uh a, a internet video player and just um check out flamingo mating dance ritual or something like that uh -huh. and just watch all the beautiful myriad videos that are online from uh, the BBC and other places of these huge groups of like hundreds. And like you said, they can group in the millions. At least uh, the tens are, to hundreds of thousands. But yes, I'm, I'm, I'll yeah. bet there was a flamingo flock once that hit million and they were like, we did it. A flock? A flamboyance. I'm sorry. Thank you for saving <laughs> me from myself. Uh, and they just, you know, they move around and dance. And if, you know, a lot of um, mating rituals include dance in the wild, but mm -hmm. it's usually like a male dancing to attract the attention of the female. Mm -hmm. But in this case, they're both trying to impress one another. Mm -hmm. And the most, um, uh, I guess, prolific maters are the ones, they're about 20 years old, by the way, which is right in the wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. But they, they're the ones that have the most dance moves and the the best ability to switch between those moves. And it's really kind of cute, you know? It's like literally dancing, and how impressive is your dance? Right, and it's, it's, it bears a strong resemblance to how humans mate, where, like, you're at a club and you're dancing together to see how you yeah. connect, and if it's just right, then you go off together and stay together for a year. Right. <laughs> and that's just like flamingos are. Uh, right, and back to that. When they do finally get together... The, both the male and the female um, will help uh, nurture that egg yeah. and sit with that egg because it's only one egg. Um, the incubation period is pretty short. It's about a month. And so they, they're really both involved in that process, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's remarkable, actually. Um, some of those dance moves, too, they're like stuff you'd expect, you know, like um, flapping and bending their heads and sticking their tails up and stuff. But they also do th – huh? A lot of head work. That's right. Yeah. So, from what I've seen. It, yes. So then that's what you would think with a, a flamingo. But they also have at least one move where they put like a wing points in one direction and a leg points in another, mm. which very much brings to mind John Travolta on the cover of Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> and there's actually a name for that move. It's called the disco finger. So uh, flamingos okay. do the disco finger. So if a flamboyance of flamingos <laughs> doing the disco finger isn't enough to make you love flamingos, then there's something really wrong with you. Yeah, that's another bumper sticker. We've got uh, batteries kill flamingos and, and flamingos with the disco sticker Dis for the disco, uh, disco finger. finger. Yeah, exactly. Here's another kind of fun thing when it comes to mating season mm -hmm. is the ladies will almost adorn makeup. Um, there is a, a gland on their tail which produces, you know, how they have that, um, that that coloration. It produces a really rich version of that uh, carotenoid oil, and they will they will wipe it on their bills and on their wings as, like, like prettying themselves up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it gets even better <laughs> because after they have mated or after mating season, they stop doing that. They're just like, I'm not going to bother anymore. <laughs> yeah. Just like humans, man. Flamingos are a it's lot so like funny. humans. And I think yeah. it's actually both um, sexes that do that, that um, oh, apply okay. makeup. I don't think it's just females. But, yeah, they're, they're just like, whatever. We we already landed a mate. Was I just flamingo sexist? A little bit, but that's okay. You, you think, didn't mean it. I think I was. There's also another remarkable thing about flamingos is that they're part of just a, a small handful of birds that produce milk for their young. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That would make them mammals. Wrong. There's actually, a, like, pigeons, flamingos, and I don't remember the other one. There's maybe one or two more that produce milk. And what this is called is crop milk. And they produce it through um, glands that line all along their digestive tract. And it's full of that carotenoid-rich, um, fatty-rich um, food 
There's also a lot of red blood cells, which I suspect probably imparts to their young, um, like, immunity to, like, disease and stuff like that. And it's, mm. like, really red. Um, so people are like, wow, this, that flamingo's killing the other flamingo. It's dripping blood all over it. That's actually, it's, it's crop milk. And that's pretty cool because, Chuck, both sexes produce the crop milk and both sexes take turns not only caring for the chick but feeding the chick too. And, Chuck, by yeah. the way, they only lay one egg at a time typically. So a couple, this monogamous couple, will both be feeding their one kid uh, yeah. milk at the same time. Well, not at the same time probably, but, you know, yeah. in the same rearing. How about that? And, and both uh, letting their appearance go. That's right. It's the same time. Not wearing any makeup. They both look very tired. <laughs> uh, the this um, the parents care for this little chicky for about a week in the nest, mm -hmm. and then they kind of go to daycare almost, uh, in that they go off with all the other little babies, and they're called uh, crutches, and there are a few adults sort of watching out, like day daycare workers. Right. Uh, and then 9 to 13 weeks later, and we should say they're born um, basically sort of kind of grayish white or brownish white right. and then once they start you know eating all the stuff then they get that pink hue but uh, nine to 13 weeks is when they're gonna kind of you know get ready to go and be full-fledged flamingos easy peasy they can also perhaps form same-sex couples right mm -hmm. like there there was a pair at the denver zoo it's very very sweet uh freddie mercury and lance bass uh, Lance was a Chilean flamingo. Freddie Mercury was an American flamingo. And RSA was, I guess is. I think they're still around, but uh, sadly not together. They got together before the pandemic in 2019 and were surrogate parents, basically, uh, for breeding couples that abandoned their eggs. Mm -hmm. And then apparently about a year later after the pandemic hit, they said, it's too much. I've had enough. <laughs> right. Uh, but we'll part close friends. I, the human Lance Bass is surely honored to have had a flamingo named after him that was in mm -hmm. a same-sex couple with a flamingo named after Freddie Mercury. Don't you think? <laughs> sure, he already has a fish named after him. Man, Dad. Sorry. We should take a break. Yeah, we should. All right, we'll be right back. Stuff you should know. All right, Chuck, we're back. And um, people have really enjoyed flamingos for a long time. A lot longer than, than even just since we started appreciating flamingos, you and me. Yeah, like a few days ago. Yeah. Like way uh, longer than that, like thousands of years longer than that. As a matter of fact, there's a um, cave painting from southern Spain that uh, dates from 7,000 years before present that has a flamingo on it. It's pretty much unmistakable. Yeah. I'll just look at the cave, and there are the answers. Uh, they're in Egyptian <laughs> art. They're, you know, since there has been kids' books, they've been all over kids' books because mm -hmm. kids uh, obviously are, are going to be fascinated by flamingos because they're so striking. Sure. Uh, that's why there's one hanging on my daughter's wall. Although I don't think we have any flamingo books. Oh, you need to remedy that situation. I bet if someone hasn't written one about Freddie Mercury and Lance Bass, and there's an opportunity there waiting. <laughs> I, <think. laughs> I have two flamingo dads. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, you know, it probably would also not surprise you to learn that uh, not too long ago in the 19th century, uh, flamingos were hunted and killed. Because the ladies uh, had to have those uh, lovely pink feathers in their hats. Um, they would eat flamingos. Mm -hmm. um, it was a, uh, you know, if you go back to like ancient Rome, it was a um, a delicacy. And in other parts of the world too, I think. Yeah, and that's just so, just old-timey again, kind of dim humans. Like, look at that pretty feather. I'm going to go kill that thing that has those pretty feathers. <laughs> and I'm going to kill them so often that they're going to just go extinct. So, Chuck, uh, did you know this, that they think at least the Caribbean ones, it's probable that all flamingos are, but I'm just making that up. But at the very <laughs> least, the Caribbean um, flamingos seem to hail from Florida. People consider them um, native to, like, maybe the Bahamas or Cuba or somewhere else. 
Nope. They seem to have originated or be native to South Florida, specifically the Keys. Yeah, and I think that uh, they were so overhunted, it was thought that they, like any flamingos in the 20th century, Mm -hmm. were either just travelers who got, you know, lost on the way to the Caribbean, or they were escaped captives. Uh, And so they tagged one. Uh, I think in the 2010s, there was a flamingo named uh, Conky, or Conchy, depending on how you say the word conch. Sure. Conch. Yeah. What do you say? Conky. Okay, I say conky too. Uh, And they saw this flamingo. I think they tagged it. It was near an airfield uh, on Boca Chica Key. Bosa Chica Key. Oh, Bosa? I'm just kidding. Oh. (laughs) And they gave it the old satellite transmitter treatment on the leg and then said, I'm sure this thing's going to go back to the Caribbean. And they said, no, this thing is actually sticking around and uh, is, is permanent. So, like... I think that's where they when they decided, hey, I think these these are not wayward travelers right. or captives that have escaped. I think they're Florida flamingos. Yeah, and they, they said, well, wait a minute. It's possible that they are escaped ones because there are a lot of 19th century railroad tycoons that built em- like enormous estates for themselves and imported flamingos for those estates because the local flamingos were all dead. And uh, scientists have said, like, it doesn't matter. We're just going to say this is the native right. <laughs> population rebounding. And let's just call it that and stop asking questions. It doesn't matter. Now the flamingos are coming back, and they're from Florida originally. That's right. And I think which one uh, is actually increasing in population? The Caribbean and I believe the greater are both increasing in population, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah, I think so, which is great. Yeah, that is great. It's greater. Um, there are about 20,000. I heard that, by the way. Okay. There are about 20,000 flamingos living in, um, I say captivity, it is captivity, but the, in in zoos, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have them here in our Atlanta Zoo. You can go by and visit them. I guess that counts at this place in the Bahamas, the like 15 or 20 that they had. Or probably wasn't that many, maybe about a dozen. Um, but they have found that, you know, flamingos like to be in big, large groups when it comes to these mating rituals. They like, yeah. they like a lot of... Um, a choice, I think, in their uh, selective mates. Mm-hmm. And so they said these smaller groups, they're not mating like they should. So at least one zoo in England, the, uh, well, it's spelled Colchester. I'm sure it's not pronounced that way. Um, it's probably Colster or something like that. Colky. Yeah, the Colky Zoo in England put up big uh, full-length mirrors to trick them into thinking they were in bigger groups. Right, and it worked. They like to look at themselves, too, apparently. Yeah, but, I mean, it gave them the illusion that there was way more flamingos, and they all started to dance and get it on. And, and have the, sex with a mirror. The, yeah, and the, the flamingo population in captivity in England was saved. Uh Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just wrapping it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they uh, clip their wings generally when they're in zoos because— They will fly away, of course, Mm -hmm. Uh, and if they don't get on those wings enough and they they manage to sneak out a little more wings size, then they will fly away Mm -hmm. and they'll they'll go away. And this zoo flamingo will be found many, many miles away for years and years in a row and become little celebrities. Yeah, apparently there was a ranger at the Great Salt Lake who reported a flamingo. And was I apparently told or asked if there was an elephant with it because they, there's just no flamingos at the at the Great Salt Lake. But this one named Pink Floyd escaped from the Tracy Aviary in Salt Lake City and was like, holy cow, a, a huge salt lake. This is exactly where I want to be. But sadly, um, I mean, he basically lived there for the rest of his life, but he was alone. Um, so there was actually a group in Salt Lake City called the Friends of Floyd who wanted to import 25 more flamingos. And the the people running Great Salt Lake, I guess, park were like, this is a really bad idea. These are not a native species. We should not be importing yeah. them. In the 21st century, we know better than doing that, despite how alone Floyd is. Yeah, good for them. Yeah. Uh, and I did mention eating them. They used to eat them in ancient Rome. Uh, there was a, a writer for Slate named Molly Olmsted that was – I'm um, shocked to find out about the number of Google searches for Can You Eat a Flamingo Yeah, a few years ago. And she kind of chalked it up to people not necessarily thinking like, hey, I want to go eat a flamingo, but just reading about them and people thinking, well, they're birds. I'm curious. Do people eat them? Mm-hmm. 
uh, and not a genuine like um, effort to eat a flamingo. No, but they definitely did eat them. Apparently, Pliny the Elder wrote that they have the most exquisite flavor. And um, because they that's eat— That's the tongue specifically, too. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's right, the flamingo tongues. And Ugh. flamingo meat, tongue's actually really good, man. If you're going to eat an animal, the tongue is not to be wasted, typically. I don't like tongue. That's fine. I'm just telling you, <laughs> if you've never tried it before, I believe oh, I've you're tried missing it. it. Okay, and you don't like I, it. Fine. I don't like Fair the enough. consistency, no. Wait, hold on. Let me do it. You. What? You don't like tongue? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think you should like waste it. I'm glad people eat it if they're going to be eating an animal, but uh, it's not for me. I understand. And, and yeah, I would never impress that on you. <laughs> I appreciate that. But the the meat of a flamingo probably has a really distinct taste in that they have, you know, layers of fat because they're a water bird. Water birds yeah. have layers of fat like duck. Duck is delicious, obviously, in part because of its huge fat content. But then also they eat so much um, algae that they would have huge levels of omega-3, which could give them a fishy taste, right? I think that's the deal. Too fishy. So a ducky, fishy taste. Yeah, I don't eat duck either, so I don't know what a duck tastes like. Oh, duck's really good, too. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, there's I, a I place can't eat in... anything I spend time with. I understand. And I know that's hypocritical for people that out there that are vegan. So I get it. You'd send me the email. Well, the thing is, is if you spend enough time with them, they'll let their guard down, and that's when you pounce. <laughs> There's a Chinese restaurant actually called Peking Gourmet in Falls Church, Virginia, mm. that makes an, a whole roast duck. And it is one of the best things you'll ever eat in your entire life. Okay. <laughs> I think it's called Peking Gourmet. It might just be called Peking Duck, one of the two. But it's He's in smiling. Trip. Remember yeah. the end of Christmas story? For sure. Uh, I guess that's it. I mean, we. Uh, I think we should direct people to our, I get, was it a short stuff on the lawn ornaments? Yeah, yeah, it was. We did a whole short stuff on pink flamingo lawn ornaments, and it's mm -hmm. a pretty cool story. So go seek that out is yeah. what I say. Uh, and there really isn't anything else. And since Chuck said, go seek that out. Of course, everybody, that means it's time for listener mail. Okay, I'm going to call this sort of a uh, Laron mystery solved. You know, the story of when I adopted my um, my buddy, Laron, who is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. He had a silver back. And that's when Tim Curry referred to him as looking like a baboon. Right. So this is solved by uh, Sarah Patton, I think. Uh, nice things that Sarah has to say about the show and Tim Curry and then this uh, Chuck mentioned that it, his silver back eventually disappeared and it made me think it could have been a fever coat uh, prior to birth a kitten's coat is very sensitive to heat if a mama cat has a fever during pregnancy from an illness or prolonged stress it could potentially affect the pigments in her kitten's fur huh. so a fever coat is typically gray or silver mm -hmm. and then it resolves when a kitten's around four months old although it can take up to a year uh, even though the kitten's uh, pigment um, didn't fully develop while they were in the womb, their coat is still written in their DNA. Uh, there's no negative implications for uh, the kitten's future overall health. Just a fun quirk when you're young. Yeah. Like when you're born with a vestigial tail and it falls off at age two. I guess so. So that uh, I think that solves the mystery. Um, this is from Sarah Patton, and Sarah's great and knows a lot about a cat and cat rescue and is uh, doing a lot of good work in that realm. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sarah. That is pretty cool. You put that mystery to rest and we thank you for it. How do you feel? Good? Now that it's, it's solved? I love it. I need to tell Emily uh, about the fever coat. She'll yeah, think that's sure. cool. Well, if you want to be like Sarah and put some mystery to rest, we love that kind of stuff. You can do it in an email. Send it to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.